Perhaps the most classic season ever in Trans Am racing, 1970 had it all. Each of Detroit's big three made huge commitments to the series. The over two liter pony cars were racing only amongst themselves. All the great American drivers were racing in the series. Donahue, Jones, Fulmer, Posey, Revson, and Texas's own Jim Hall. Maker and team alignments changed for 1970, with Penske switching to the AMC Javelin car. On the brakes. Let's see if I can come out of here at 7200. Seven times, 7100. Not so good. Down the flat straight. Motor seems to be a little lazy. It isn't revving up as fast. In 1970, uh, the American Motors program came about with my relationship with uh, Bill McNeely, who at that point was uh, head of marketing for American Motors. Uh, they thought that this would be a great way to show off their cars. Uh, we were looking for, uh, as an opportunity to take the expertise because we were not a factory team at that point with Chevrolet. And with American Motors willing to commit, it gave us the opportunity to grow our base. We brought in Don Cox, who was an engineer from Chevrolet. We were able to execute a new program and be successful. So it was one of the really the great experiences that I had taking really a car that was an underdog and then being making it into a winner. Penske's driver lineup, Mark Donahue, of course, and Peter Revson. Chevrolet supported Jim Hall with a new model Camaro. Chrysler plunged into the Trans Am series with two Plymouth Barracudas for Gurney and Savage and a Dodge Challenger piloted by Sam Posey. Jerry Titus, still running his own team Firebirds, focused only on his own racing effort in 1970. Bud Moore fielded a strong two-car effort for Parnelli Jones and George Vollmer, despite Ford's cutting racing budgets by three quarters. Competition was intense, and the lengths the teams would go to to get that extra advantage were remarkable. I remember uh, how the teams could outfox our technical inspectors almost every day of the week. Uh, and some of it would be was as comical as the Dickens in retrospect, but... Uh, the, the leader coming in, for example, and for his last fuel stop and the crew member dumping a 10-gallon can full of lead shot into the gasoline tank so the car would weigh enough at the end of the series. And uh, uh, shot bags found after the race, you know, or put in during the last pit stop and that kind of thing. Well, we had our car, uh, which we were very proud of and had worked uh, long and hard on, as everybody else had. Uh, but our car was pretty illegal. I mean, so was everybody else's, but ours had spent maybe a little too much time in the acid bath. You received the chassis, they were called bodies in white from the manufacturer, uh, you know, uh, no body panels, just the chassis part, no suspension or engines or anything. That's the way you started in those days in the Trans Am, and you built uh, your uh, uh, roll cage inside of that and all the strengthening points. Well, we had taken our body in white, and lowered it into this giant acid tank uh, to thin it down a little bit, to lighten it. And we left it in a little bit too long. Maybe we were thinking a little too racy that day. And uh, when we arrived at uh, Laguna, we had no real thought that we would be caught um, because other guys did acid dipping too. But John Timanis, who was the chief tech inspector, came over to our car and basically passed the car. He inspected it and he passed it. And then falling into conversation with one of our guys, he put his arm up on the roof and kind of leaned back like this and his arm made a dent, his elbow made a dent in the roof. And he went, oh boys, uh, we can't have this. You're not past inspection anymore. So he we went, oh my God, what are we going to do? Well, we had the hotline to Chrysler management and Within an hour, we had permission to cannibalize uh, one of the challengers from uh, the local dealer. So we got down to the dealer with a welder, and we torched off the roof of uh, you know somebody's car. That basically, was ready for delivery the next day. I'd forgotten that, and um, welded it on our car, and uh, started the race. The 1970 championship battle was a classic. Jones and Fulmer dominated the early part of the season. Early on, the Javelins had teething problems, but by mid-season, the renowned Penske preparation paid off. In fact, only two races on the entire year were not won by Bud Moore or Roger Penske prepared machines. 
Milt Minter would take Donnie Brook, and Vic Elford, driving for Jim Hall and the Camaro, would take Watkins Glen. Donahue would win at Brinchhampton, Road America, and Mont Tremblant. Tragedy struck at Road America as the Trans Am series suffered its first major loss. During practice on Saturday morning, Jerry Titus crashed into the bridge abutment in Thunder Valley, suffering serious injury. One of the Trans Am's greatest drivers, Titus, died 17 days later. With a second place at Watkins Glen, Donahue would keep AMC's title hopes alive. It was not to be for AMC, however, as Ford clinched the title at Seattle. With Parnelli's first place and Fulmer's fourth, the manufacturer's title went to Ford, its third in the Trans 